behavior is a, a really interesting one to try and explain, isn't it? But government's been saying they want to use this legislation to push out shonks. And yet, you know, there was that example that came out in the last week or so about uh, a provider, remain la- nameless, that mm-hmm. uh, currently going through administrative processes kind of to be wound up, like be, be not permitted to enroll students anymore, and yet got allocated quite a massive cap. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Koala News. I'm coming to you from Wadjuk, Noongar country. It is just south of Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of The Global Society. Uh, and Dirk, I'm laughing because I've just come out of a presentation to a whole bunch of Year 10 students and I'm alive, so I'm feeling pretty good right now. Nothing like a bunch of 15-year-olds to, uh, to get the blood pumping, eh? Definitely not. Like, it's the, the toughest audience out there. So much to discuss this week. And of course, like AIEC coming up next week, which I'm sure we're going to get onto. But maybe, Dirk, the place to start is on the countdown. I saw a great article in the Koala this week from Tracy Harris, 78 Mm -hmm. days ago. And of course, by the time people are listening to this podcast, 75, 76 days to go until T minus (laughs) one. T minus one, until implementation of this, uh, of whatever it is that we might see, or certainly the date in which the government's wanting to go live with this, which is 1 January. So yeah, not long to go now. Not long to go. And very good article from Tracy Harris. Maybe let's jump in there because of course, the report from the Senate committee into um, the ESOS bill has been tabled and there's a bit that's come out of that, hasn't there? Yeah, that's exactly right. So look, it's probably been reported on widely, but for those that don't or haven't read it or, or gotten up to speed with it, the Senate Inquiry Committee for Education and Employment had four sittings. Um, I think most people are probably aware of that. There were two extra ones scheduled in there and certainly the fourth one was, was very unexpected. So it was delayed, delayed, delayed. And then the reporting was, was meant to be around the 8th of October. October or around that point. So the interesting bit, I guess, is that it was tabled a day late. So it was due, I think, on the 8th and it was and it was actually uh, tabled on the 9th. That made it really skinny for the Senate to actually debate on it. So normally, I guess the normal process is, you know, something gets tabled and then there's a debate and then there's probably motions put forward on amendments, et cetera, et cetera. The tabling has happened, but the debate did not. So that's been pushed. And the really sad bit now is that that's been pushed until the 18th of November which is the next date that the Senate sits. So there's two lots of sitting date left for the year, both for the Senate and for the House. It's the 18th to the 21st of November will be the first one, and then the 25th to the 28th of November, and that'll see us out for the year. So at this point, if debate happens on the 18th, which, um, again, we, we will all be glued to a document called the Order of Business, which is normally released either the night before or the morning of, to see whether it's actually scheduled for debate. If it is, and if you look at the report itself, and we've discussed that report, but obviously Labor's looking to pass the report with as minimal changes as possible. The coalition have criticised, I guess, the the building of the, of the legislation, the drafting, and the way in which the government's gone about managing international education and migration. However, there's been a lack of uh, recommendations, I guess, from the coalition. So there's a bit of a black hole there in terms of what the coalition might be might be looking at. The Greens have come really have come forth, and they've been really consistent. So look, if there's anything fair to say about the Greens in this situation, is Senator Faruqi, who's the Green Senator who was on the committee, was pretty consistent in her question, her line of questioning through the through the inquiry, and that report matches that. So there's a real consistency there. And then Senator Pocock, the independent from the ACT, he put in, I guess, some additional comments with, again, with some recommendations. So when we get to the 18th, the first question is, is will it be debated? And so again, looking out for that order of business, and then looking at what that debate takes place. Now, there's, there's definitely still a long way to go, I think, on this. So this isn't a bill that's going to be put up and passed easily, I don't think. Although, you know, I stand corrected, I might be wrong. Or you got to think though, four inquiries, two extra ones with 99.5, 99.9% of the feedback stating that this is a really bad piece of legislation. For it to go through smoothly, I, I would, I just don't, I don't see it. So then the question becomes is, I could provide quite a succinct summary. When when the report dropped and you, you put out an email to the industry, once again, mate, thanks thanks for doing that because that just straight away, I knew exactly what was going on um, with this critical piece of, of information. But I read through all of the recommendations, read through the whole report, and I think I could summarise it in two simple ideas. The first one was Labor patting themselves on the back for, for doing a good job and saying this thing should be passed. 
and everyone else basically calling <laughs> calling this a piece that <laughs> needs to be amended and scrapped altogether. Something something like that. So if you haven't read the detailed summary that Dirk provided, I've given it to you there in, in about 10 seconds. Of course, Dirk, we all know how these things work, given the extraordinary consultation that's taken place or lack thereof. We all know that, that this is going to going to drop at the last possible minute, the 28th of November, probably we'll find out what our fate is. Well, wouldn't that just be perfect for everyone? So don't forget, Rob, this has got to go, if, if there are amendments, this will need to go back to the House for ratification as well. We possibly are looking at, you know, if this bill does get through before the end of the year, we're possibly looking at not even that first sitting period for it to pass. It may end up coming down right to the 11th hour in that second period, which is somewhere between the 25th and the 28th. Now, if that is the case, there's what, 33 days before it's implemented. So, you know, assuming, and, and again, my question that I, I think I've probably harped on upon uh, in previous podcasts is what if there's amendments that are in this bill that actually uh, cut across what the departments have been working on? So obviously there's been a massive IT build and that's been the line of questioning from a number of senators. Are we ready for this? Can we get this done? What if there is a recommendation that says something like, you know, we need to amend another system to do something different? You know, does that then throw it all up in the air to come back down and we're now looking at a delay? Who knows? Quite possibly. Who knows? Who knows? Interestingly, the parliament doesn't resume after the Christmas break until February, typically. The dates for 2025 haven't yet been released. But of course, if this isn't passed by the end of the year, then we're going to end up in this situation where the damage is done, essentially, and institutions, organisations could have actually continued you know, business as, as usual, and we could end up in this this horrible hybrid situation, which once again just begs the question, you know, if there were going to be changes of this magnitude, why not push them back to 2026 to give people to adapt? But I think we've well and truly, truly identified by now. We know the reason for that, that this is just purely political. Yeah, so there's two points. I, mean, I think you, you raised that timeline, that February timeline, really, really well. I actually caught up with a Labor person yesterday, um, not really inside info, but, you know, their comment was probably February for the election. So if we're looking at February, well, I mean, the, the general kind of feeling on the street is March. So depending on on where things are at, and I suspect, uh, you know, the government will go when the Reserve Bank first reduces interest rates. I think that's going to be a key deliberation in terms of when the, when the election will be called. And, and they'll go to town on that when they do. But if we go into caretaker mode, then this thing gets pushed back to post the election. So again, uh, when we start thinking about some of the ramifications, and if we think about, if we go back to the last election, uh, there's a really good uh, lesson, I think, to be learnt here. If you recall, the Liberal government before the last election allowed students to work unrestricted for that period post-COVID. That actually went into caretaker mode, and the government didn't pick up on that until much later. So again, these things, you know, government comes back in, and if the Libs get in, you know, they're going to take their time in terms of getting their, their feet underneath the desk, and, you know, this, then we might be pushing this down to mid next year. You just don't know where these things sit. So, you know, again, I mean, the, everyone talks about certainty or clarity and or uncertainty and, and lack of clarity. This is where we're at. I mean, it's it's horrible. You said, um, you know, the status quo, and I think there's a lot of people nervous about the status quo because the status quo means what, you know, Ministerial Direction 107 is still in. As Claire Field rightly points out, Ministerial Direction 106, which is the new student test and, and some of those enhanced measures of scrutiny that, that, that the government have been putting into place in the visa system, they're still going to exist. So, you know, I'm not sure when we parlay that with Minister Burke pausing the SSVF assessment levels, there's going to be those people who are in assessment level three are going to be potentially in a lot of pain for to, up to the next six months, which is almost unfathomable when you think about, you know, the rhetoric the government's putting out about wanting to actually improve things and, and do things better. So, yeah, mate, not much. There's a lot of grey in that. And this, of course, has consequences out there in the real world. We've seen examples as a um, Tracy again, once again, writing in the Koala was highlighting an example of, I believe it was a university, was it not, starting to make some pretty strong inducements for onshore recruitment, you know, in advance of these you know, changes that are potentially coming into effect on the 1st of January. So just kind of racing to try and recruit as many students onshore as possible, which is kind of predictable, isn't it? You know, things things are getting tough. Sometimes people don't have yeah, and this is where, I mean, I think, you know, you'd probably agree with this one. This is where, you know, the pub test and the rules don't align. And this is where I think common sense and where the sector really wants the government to actually start looking at, you know, the pub test of, you know, onshore poaching, onshore recruitment is something that can we ever get away from? Probably not. 
And should students be able to change if they've got a situation where they're not happy, they're finding it difficult for whatever reason? Absolutely. But we need to take the incentives away from onshore poaching and onshore recruitment. And this kind of behaviour, it's just not acceptable. So again, when we think about the changes the government's making, um, I think the sector's crying out for the government to intervene in certain areas, but they're just not not looking at it in that lens. It's just a, a more blunt instrument approach and making the cooing noises to the to the electorate. There was also an extraordinary story that Tracy put a post up about another one of the private providers that but behaviour is a, a really interesting one to try and explain, isn't it? But government's been saying they want to use this legislation to push out shonks. And yet, you know, there was that example that came out in the last week or so about uh, a provider, it'll remain like, nameless, that mm-hmm. uh, currently going through administrative processes kind of to be wound up, like be, be not permitted to enrol students anymore mm-hmm. and yet got allocated quite a massive cap. Yeah, I mean, and again, when we talk back to those, the consistency in the allocations, this is where the, the Senate inquiry had a, n- a number of questions and some of them were answered potentially, some of them were not answered and, and there just seems to be more and more examples of that. So, you know, the, the example that you use is, is quite rightly so. When somebody's, you know, when there's an organisation that's going to be wound up, how are they getting these caps? You know, the government might sit back and say, well, you know, we're doing this in good faith and when they do get wound up, those those cap places go back to the pool question really becomes is why they're being allocated in the first place. So it, um, it's, a re- it's a really good example of some of the inconsistencies that's going on at the moment and, and the application of this hasn't just hasn't been squeaky clean whatsoever. Yeah, and I guess that's frustrating for, for, for the good providers, right, who are trying to do the right thing and yet their, their allocations are much smaller. When and Once again, it's due process to go into it. I, I don't know the full story about this. I'm not calling any provider dodgy or not. That's up to people to make up their own minds and, and you know, processes to unfold but very frustrating it's frustrating (laughs) yes you you can think of at least a dozen providers in the first three seconds who are amazing providers delivered great quality over all these years and yet they are suffering when some of these numbers have been allocated to absolutely bonkers places if people are honest about it yep anyway so 78 days 76 days to go by the time you're listening to it perhaps perhaps less and we're all going to be watching carefully throughout november to see if um, if that debate is taking place and and what closely. I think some really good commentary in the choir this week about what is going to happen. You know, the, the Liberal Party is keeping their cards very close to their chest, very little in terms of recommendations to try and improve this bill in the report. So what are they actually playing at? Very hard to know. And and the only time low is when this actually hits the Senate and people raise their feet to, to the bill. Amen to that. Amen, Amen to that. To that. Well, moving on, staying in the same sort of zone, but moving on slightly, I did see that there's some new a new article published in the Koala by Alan Olson, who, mm-hmm. for those who don't know Alan Olson's work, absolute industry legend, has you know really been at the forefront of commentary and, and statistics for, for a decade. Did the ADU-IDF benchmarking for years and years and years, so um, really knows his stuff and, and very, very on the money. Currently retired, but we're lucky that he's still weighing in from time to time and and chipping in his extraordinary expertise. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities, from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Tell us about what Alan's been, been writing about this week. Yeah, so Alan, Alan sent over a piece just a couple of days ago, and it was based around a piece that was done uh, probably two weeks back, where the ABS uh, released some data on Expo on international education as an export. And I always find this discussion fascinating because those, I mean, let's just cut to the chase. Those that are pro-international education say, you know, it's all export revenue. What are you talking about? Those who are anti-international education say, oh, well, you know, half of, or, you know, there's a, a larger amount that is actually generated onshore, so it's not export revenue, et cetera, et cetera. The ABS tried to define that a little bit better, um, which, um, you know, again, is is one of those things. So I'll read you a paragraph of, of Alan's piece because I think this kind of says it all. Um, classification of international education as an export does not mean that all expenditure by international students is funded from overseas. ABS suggests that around a quarter of the total expenditure of 50.5 
$50.492 billion, uh, $50.492 billion, or around $13 billion in the 2023-24 financial year is funded by international students working in Australia or for Australian employees. So I think we're now getting a definition a, a, and hopefully a fairly clear one that three quarters um, is, is actually export revenue. And when we talk about the whole pie and, and about 25% is not. So Mate, that number for at fifty point four nine two billion is the largest it's ever been, and it shows that our sector is just growing and growing and growing. So when we think about contribution to the economy, and when I talk about this, it isn't necessarily export gen. We're talking about contribution consumption to the economy. You know, thirteen billion of that generated onshore, but the rest of it is all export revenue. So big, big numbers, and I'm not sure that the government has really factored into what you know, kind of cutting some of that stuff out will actually do to the economy, as we saw with Treasury uh, and, and, their, and their testimony at the, four, at the fourth um, inquiry. Well, can I give you an example, just as you were sort of talking about that $13 billion worth of essentially GDP, right? Like th- these are people who are out there. Yeah, well, it's still, it's still GDP, yeah. They're earning money. Consum- consumption base. Mm. Consumption, exactly, Put, earning their money and putting it back into the economy. That is the equivalent of the entire electricity, gas, water, and waste services industry in Australia. It's also $13. Stay, stay with me. Accommodation and food services, also a $13 billion industry. I'm taking this from ABS data. Administrative and support services, also a $13 billion industry. So literally, we, we start to impact that. And we're talking, in its own right, the contribution to the national economy that international students are making is as significant as some of these major, major, major areas of our economy. Surely saying that uh, it doesn't count as export revenue, therefore it's we shouldn't be so concerned about it as an absolute load of... <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, even taking that $13 billion, I mean, I, without sending that, even taking $13 billion out, you know, what's that, 50, you know, $37 billion or something, you know, in terms of export revenue, that's still massive. You know, it's what, our, it's what our entire sector was, you know, a number of years ago. And that's just the export component of it. So, again, when we start thinking about this, I, you know, I, I start quaking in my boots as to, you know, what this means for the economy and where this might lead over the next couple of quarters as numbers start coming off as, we, as we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's maybe turn to some some of the more positive views. I mean, also, like, positive news to see Alan Olsen still delivering the goods for the sector report get on the koala news.com and check that out but new south wales has announced the finalists in its international education awards which is always a nice time of year to see the great work that the sector is putting out there starting to be recognized yeah that's right rob the category i mean there are a lot of finalists so we won't go through all of them but the categories we've got new south wales student of the year for schools new south wales student of the year for ellicos and vet new south wales international student of the year for higher education the international education industry award for education provider and finally new south wales international education industry award for partnership excellence so all in all there are a whole bunch of, of finalists there and certainly i wish them all the very best it's it's as you said it's the time of the year you know wa just had their export awards south australia just had some awards it's really the time of the year where we start seeing we can celebrate you know some of the things that we do and, and some of the achievements of these students who are you know are just are just fantastic to see it's great i love this time of year when suddenly your linkedin feed like starts lighting up with all of the photos of people suited up at awards dinners holding trophies and that it's, it's a really good warm fuzzy feeling time of year and speaking of warm and fuzzy like we're about to go into the warm, warmest and fuzziest event of all, which is AIC next week. I'm really pumped for next week. Mate, I am, I am too. I'm looking forward to it. it. I think it's, can I say it's been a long time coming? I feel like we've been build, building up to this for a while. And you know, certainly for me being based over here in Perth, it's, it's going to be really nice to be back on the East Coast and, and reconnect with people face to face. I feel like it's been a long time since that's happened, so it's going to be really, really good. Yeah, you know, as we've spoken about in previous podcasts, the program is fantastic. We've seen some of the, some of the work behind the scenes and and all the work that's gone into it. The sensory room for the first time, the amount of I've just I looked on the app last night actually just to start planning, and yeah, the amount of exhibitors that are there. It's um, mate, it's going to be a great few days. I'm really, really, I'm really looking forward to it. Exhibitors including you and I, do indeed. Global Horizons Koala News booth. You're going number eighty six. 86 folks you, you won't be able to miss us put it that way <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna let any, any more of the secret out other than that but you'll come and you'll find us and you'll see us that's what we can promise i'm going to be podcasting quite extensively from the booth i've been um, busily lining up interviews 
over the last few days. It's I'm so pumped, to be honest, mate, because having this opportunity, I get three days just sitting mm. down talking with like some of the best people that this industry has, picking into the travel stories, the experiences, the career advice and that sort of stuff. I'm extremely excited about what's coming up. And outside of the being on the conference floor, um, exhibition floor itself and podcasting there, I am going to be wandering around with my little mobile recorder. So if you see me and my Cooper coming wandering up to you at some point, be ready that I might have a question for you about how your conference experience is going. And you too, dear listener, can also appear on the Global Horizons podcast. So I'm, I'm really excited to be starting to dig into some of those experiences that people are having at the conference as we go. And mate, the other, the other thing you put me onto, I think, was the fun run. The oh, yeah. Fun run, which is which day? Wednesday morning? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Wednesday morning, I believe. Yeah, because, yeah, Wednesday morning, being run by Acumen. You can find it just by Googling AIEC fun run and you'll you'll find it. 5K run, 5K fun run just to raise some funds for charity. I'm looking forward to pulling on my running shoes and and getting out there and getting a little little bit of exercise next week in between everything else. Well, I think I might see how uh, how big Tuesday night is before I make that commitment. It's a very wise, very wise and seasoned, experienced uh, conference goer, Dirk. Very wise. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, Rob, the NCP uh, have just announced their new advisory committee, and Trevor Goddard has written that one up. Congratulations to the following people: Grace Corcoran, who is a diplomacy program lead at AsiaLink; Nicholas Farrelly, who's a PVC at UTAS. Uh, Jessica Gallagher, who's Deputy Vice Chancellor at Adelaide University, the one and only Phil Honeywood, the CEO of the International Education Association, Renee Latty, the Chief Executive Partner at King and Wood Mallisons, Ashok Mysore, member of the Victorian Trade and Investment Advisory Board, Mr. Luke Chi, CEO of University of Australia, Peter Verghese, Chancellor of the University of Queensland, uh, Luke Chi, CEO of Universities Australia, Peter Verghese, the Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Eleanor Williams from the ANU Indonesia Institute, and Hayley Winchcombe, Engagement Manager at Mandela Partners. To provide a little bit of context on this collection of people, this is a really good advisory group in, in my view. Obviously, we have some a, a couple of pure learning abroad specialists amongst there, but then also some senior international educators and senior university staff members who have got a deep experience in learning abroad over the years too. Jessica, Jessica Gallagher uh, used to look after learning abroad. I oh, used to manage that section of learning abroad at UQ many years ago. And the like Grace Corcoran, former NCP New Colombo Plan scholar, same with Hayley Winchcombe. So some really good people on this, and including Peter Vagate, who um, is currently Chancellor of the University of Queensland, but was also the Secretary of DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, when the New Colombo Plan was introduced back in 2013 under, under Julie Bishop as Foreign Minister. And so what I really love about this collection of people, it, it's a bit of the old and the new, bringing in people who've got a a real connection to the historical um, importance of the program and where it's come from, as well as some people that are going to be more future focused. And and to be honest, having been part of the original reference group and planning of the entire NCP over 10 years ago now, you know, I I really believe that programs kind of have to evolve or die in some way. And so I really think this is amazing that um, uh, under Tim Watts, who's the Assistant Foreign Minister, they're conducting this review, they've brought in a new advisory group, they're starting to, you know, have a look at the program and, and what it's going to look like o- over the next. That's really critical for the longevity of a program like this, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. What I love about Trevor's piece is he kind of puts it in a context of, you know, look how NCP has changed mobility. And it's so true. It, without the, the new the NCP, mobility may still be languishing like it was, you know, before it started. Struggled to get students abroad. So this has really been, you know, a real shot in the arm for that and has really changed the way in which I think the sector looks at at outbound mobility. So it's um yeah, it's a it's a, it's a really wonderful thing. A bit of context as well for those people who who aren't from that side of international education, but pre New Colombo plan, so pre twenty thirteen, a lot of students, more students were going to North America and Europe, UK, those sort of destinations, Canada, um, of course in North America. But since then we've seen a dramatic shift to the Asia Pacific and that's been driven I'd say almost entirely by the new climate plan. And this is really about increasing Australia's regional expertise, building the people to people to people linkages, enhancing language skills, building those connections between organizations, Australia and across our beautiful region. And so the NCP is like this critical piece of Australia's soft diplomacy. And I'm really heartened to see, um, you know, the quality of people that are on this, um, on this advisory group. 
And for those people who are interested, who are on the learning abroad side, or or really you know appreciate Australia's role in the Indo Pacific and our place in the Indo Pacific, there is a consultation open right now. It's open. It just seems like everything in international. It's not open for very long. It's open until the first of November. But you have an opportunity now to provide your feedback on what the new Colombo plan may look like into the future. You can simply Google it, New Colombo Plan NCP submissions, and you'll you'll find it very, very quickly. You can submit up to a thousand words and there's a number of questions on the DFAT website that they're looking to answer. Things around how they can continue to evolve the program, the role of languages and other things like this. So once again, we've seen how important it is this year to make your voice heard. You do have another opportunity to do so. I know we're all a little bit um, report writing written out but don't miss this kind of once in a decade opportunity to, to contribute your thoughts on what that program should look like into the future. It looks like you got something, a bit of a cough stuck in your throat. <laughs> it's been... I do, I do. You'll recall a couple of weeks ago I was in Sydney and I took the red eye from Perth and ever since then I've had this tickle that I just can't get rid of. So fingers crossed, <clears throat> next week it'll be the end of it. Well, mate, it's been great to chat with you and for those of you listening along, of course, for all of your news in, about Australian international education, thekoalanews.com, and make sure you follow along on LinkedIn. That's the first place that you're going to see all of the breaking news around Australian international ed. And oh, mate, I might have got to say congratulations. I saw that you just blasted through 6,000 LinkedIn followers. That came fast. It only feels like uh, like yesterday that we went through 5,000. So that the last 1,000 has been, um, been been really good. And, mate, it's really humbling to think 12 months ago, you know, or a little bit over 12 months ago now, but this was all started. It's been a really quick uptake. So thank you to everyone out there who reads the koala and who engages with it. It's really, really appreciated and humbling. Thanks to you, Dirk, because we wouldn't be up to date. And I reckon this year, without that service and with Campus Morning Mail having um, sort of quietly closed down uh, last year, I honestly don't know how this industry would have been staying up to date with this all these critical changes. So, you know, a massive congratulations to you for the for the great work you've done this year because we would have just been operating in a void otherwise. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. And without further ado, that's the latest from us. We'll see a lot of you hopefully at AIEC next week. And, mate, I'm hoping that your voice is better by then because I've got a feeling we're going to have a fair bit of talking to do. You and me both. I might be hoarse by the end of the week, but I'll be getting out the tea and the honey straight after this. Perfect. Great to chat, Dirk. See you soon. You too, Rob. Cheers. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by the Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, the Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time-consuming and complex, So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to the Global Society, globalsociety.com.au. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.